I hope people are there and I hope this is working. We will see. So if someone is there, let me know. So what I was gonna do, I'll give another minute for people to log on and see who is out there. And then I'll be talking about questions that I've been getting through IG Live and, not IG Live, through IG questions and answers and some of the questions that have popped up on comments here before. Oh, somehow. <laughs> My husband has all the lights on automatic and it's very annoying so that the children don't keep the lights on. So maybe that's like a work mom, life mom balance kind of thing. All right. It is 11. So one of the first questions I got was, what do you think makes a great doctor? And this is such an important question and I think that's a great question that someone asked as opposed to how hard is your life or what are your hours like or what's your salary so what makes a great doctor I honestly think it's a passion for your patients as well as improving their health and continuously learning you really have to learn continuously when you are a physician or really in healthcare, whether a doctor or some other field nurse practitioner, physician assistant, you have to stay up to date. It's not something where you just go to med school and you do your residency, do your training, and then you're done. And you need to keep learning and keep um, growing in order to be a good physician. And I think that's what really makes a Hallmark good physician is that component with the education and just that thirst for knowledge. And then also just liking interacting with people and caring about their stories. I think that's very, very important because we all know of doctors that don't necessarily have the best bedside manner. And, you know, I think it helps you deliver your treatment plan if you can really connect with a patient. So I think having that kind of, um, you know, rapport with a patient and being interested with them or by them is the most important. So I think that those are two criteria for that. And how do you find balance being a great surgeon and a great mom and running projects? So some of you might know I have uh, three children. I also run my ophthalmology practice and I'm in currently starting a medical conference for women in medicine to teach them the business side and the skills that we don't get taught in medical school or graduate school. So contract negotiation, salary negotiation, how do you manage staff, you know, all of those things that are so important to running a business or even just being a physician, whether you're employed in a larger setting or self-employed. Those are so important. So we're starting a conference called Pinnacle. It's going to be this December 6th through 8th at the Four Seasons in Dallas. So you can check it out at pinnacleconference.org. And then the second thing that I just started this year as well is a mommy and me clothing company, which is Ariana, like A-R-Y-A-N-A -A clothing. Uh, and, you know, that was really just more of a passion project that I have a really creative side that sometimes doesn't get expressed in medicine or being a surgeon or being a boss. So this is just something that I wanted to do. And I started with two of my friends. And yeah, so how do I balance it all? It's tough. I now built in time into my schedule to be able to handle the administration of running a practice. You know, it's really different because before I used to feel guilty about having that time away from patients and um, blocking them off, you know, the today is Friday. So it's my administration, administrative day, my admin day. That's how I usually call it. So it's my admin day and I can do the QuickBooks. I can, I need to call the accountant later today. Um, you know, I can handle all of that before I would just try to cram it in after work. And it was infringing on my time with my children and it just was making me burnt out and not happy. So I think realizing what your limits are and what you can do and what your you know, you actually have control over that you can change is really important. So 
Um, that is one thing. So this is, you know, totally impromptu for doing this live Q and A. Um, but hopefully that helps. So it's just the balance and people have tossed that word around balance, work-life balance, work-life fit, work-life harmony, work-life integration, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's about just that intersection between your work and your home life, whether you have a family or not, or just your personal interests or whatever you need to sustain you. And I think that's becoming much more a topic of conversation in so many different fields right now that wasn't the case previously um, in medicine or, you know, I'm curious to know if this is happening in law as well. So, yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting discussion. I'm glad that it's coming to the forefront because otherwise it does lead to burnout, I think. You know, if I had to juggle everything and also take care of my children, I, I couldn't. So I need to be able to build in those admin days and I need to be able to think about how is what I'm doing at work going to affect my family life? Because a lot of times, unfortunately, women are still doing the lion's share of the household chairs and chores. And as great as my husband is at with the children and taking them to activities and being really involved, he's the one that sits with them to practice piano and all of that stuff, you know the lion's share of just the planning and that organization, that constant like thinking, okay, do we have a babysitter so we can go to the parent teacher conference? Do we need, you know, just that kind of navigation, I think typically falls to a woman and definitely in my household, it falls to me. The cooking um, usually falls to me as well, or the planning of the meals, we'll have someone that comes to help. So that helps with my work-life balance too, because if I get home at six o'clock and my children want to eat at six, that's obviously not possible. So on my later days, I have someone that can come and help um, cook so that we have dinner ready, which is really, really nice. Or you end up ordering a lot of takeout, which is not what we wanted to because that's just not as healthy. So that's kind of how we achieve our work-life balance. Okay, I've got to slip on my reading glasses here. Ah, closed. Sorry. Um, the other things that I've often gotten with other questions just about being a woman in a surgical field. I'm lucky ophthalmology is a more female dominant field, surgical field than some of the other ones. And um, so I feel like I can express myself a lot more now than previously. Hello, Karthika, what are some of my hobbies? So I love exercise, which might sound crazy, but I, so I count doing the Peloton bike as one of my hobbies. And I have a very creative side. So that is why I started that clothing company. That's kind of my passion, like fashion and um, creating something. I love art. I will draw I, like water. We just did this women in ophthalmology conference. I just went to it. It was amazing. And we had like a watercolor. You could sign up to do this watercolor painting. And it was so cathartic. Like I, I miss that. Those are some of the things I used to do a lot of when I was younger, even in med school, um, drawing and painting and sketching and that kind of thing. I make jewelry. And that's another one of my hobbies. Um, organizing. Can organizing count as a hobby? I really, if you can't tell by my color-coded bookshelf here behind me, um, there. See, I arrange my books by color code. Anyway, um, I like organizing. So those are some of my hobbies there. Hi, Tejas. Okay, fourth year med student applying to ophthalmology, the entrepreneurship aspects of opto. I think that's such a great question because there are now just all these startups created by ophthalmologists for filling the needs of our patients, which I think are great. And I do think now it's a lot more accepted to have a business mind and to be interested in the business aspect either of ophthalmology or of something ophthalmology related. But, you know, so I've seen apps for, you know, vision tests and trying to do contact lens prescriptions and all sorts of things. Not that I necessarily agree with those things, but, you know, there is that entrepreneurship aspect of it. You know, I think a lot of that, it's interesting probably is more pursued by those of us in private practice because we have that flexibility and there's no intellectual property rights um, the way that there are in academic medicine. So, you know, certain things, which is one of the reasons that we created this Pinnacle uh, conference that's in December, is I never thought about it. When I signed my contract for Boston Children's, fresh out of fellowship, I did not really read it other than the salary amount and the amount of vacation. But a lot of what whatever you create, you know, really belongs to them. So 
it's hard to, I think, pursue the entrepreneurship. Though David Hunter at Boston Children's is developed this um, auto screener for children, which he is promoting aside from children. So it's certainly possible to do it in academic medicine as well as in private practice. I think that there's just, there's a lot of different avenues to go. I know a lot of ophthalmologists that have gotten MBAs as well. So I think that's really interesting to pursue. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Hopefully that it did, but I think it's, yeah, it's changing. I mean, the world of medicine in general is changing. I mean, and now also I see ophthalmologists that leave private practice and just that are speaking or that are consulting and, you know, I think that's great because your dreams do change as you continue. You know, I've been a practicing ophthalmologist now for 12 years. And so 12 years out of fellowship. So that's a long time. And, you know, why I still am very passionate about pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus, but I am realizing I have this entrepreneurial spirit that was not acknowledged before because I felt like you couldn't do that and be a a surgeon that was taken seriously. And I like, I really like that that's changing. So I think that's such a good question. Okay, let me check on IG. If you have any more questions, please, please let me know. Okay. And sorry, I don't know why my Wi-Fi is like so slow. Okay. Someone asked about here and just the cost of living and what it's like to be a doctor in Hawaii. And yes, the cost of living is really, really high. So housing prices, at least on Oahu, like in Honolulu, are pretty similar actually to San Francisco. So if you know what San Francisco prices are, it's kind of the same out here. So it is difficult. And unfortunately, the pay is less. Um, I would say about a half what you get on the mainland. So that's also why in certain areas, there's huge doctor shortages. I mean, internists, pediatricians, ob -gynes. there's a huge shortage, not just on Oahu, but especially on the neighbor islands, you know, on the big island of Kauai, on Kauai, Maui, there's, there's shortages of certain doctors. And so there's no pediatric ophthalmologist or strabismus specialist on Kauai, uh, sorry, no, there is one on Kauai, there's none on Maui or the big island. So the insurance company actually flies the patient over to see me in Honolulu. And when it's a pediatric patient, they will fly both the child and the, you know, obviously one parent over and tickets cost like $150. I mean, it's not an inexpensive thing, but that's a side note. Anyway, the reason that there's doctor shortage is because the pay is less, housing and cost of living is higher, you know, gallon of milk, $6, box of cereal, $6. I mean, everything is so expensive. There's no Trader Joe's. Yeah. Um, lots of things are just so much more expensive out here. Um, so it makes it difficult to stay here. You have to really want to be in Hawaii, whether it's lifestyle wise. I mean, I am not from here. My husband was born and raised here and his family has been here for generations. So that's how we ended up here. And there's, you know, our fa the families here right now, my kids go to the same school as their cousins. I mean, that's just a really wonderful aspect that my kids wouldn't have had if we'd gone to North Carolina where my parents are. Um, but cost of living is high. And I think it's mainly because there's just this capitation and the, the Hawaii version of Blue Cross Blue Shield has a large percentage of the patients. So they set the fees. So that's basically, yeah, that's basically the downside of living here. I would say the plus side is, come on, it's Hawaii. Patients are amazing. They are so wonderful and so nice. So I practiced in New York. Well, I was in training in New York and um, I practiced in Boston and then I'm here and it's just my New York and Boston patients were very nice, but white patients are just a different, I mean, they're just part of your family and that's the way I want to practice medicine. You know, they will bring you cookies. Like I have this patient and every time he comes, he buys lunch for the entire staff. He tries to, you know, he's just so friendly and that's just kind of the norm around here at Christmas. It's crazy. My car, low carb diet is down the tubes because people are just bringing us like home baked stuff all the time. It's really, really nice. So, um, so sorry about the text messaging. I don't know if you can hear those little dings, but that's kind of what it's like to live here in Hawaii. The patients are wonderful. You know, you look out my door, my, I'm two blocks from the ocean. 
it's summer all year long, like Olaf wants and let it go. My children can play outside all year long. I think that's wonderful. I think also just, you know, compared to other places, like I was saying that, you know, like compared to New York or San Francisco or LA, even people that are in that wealthier, you know, bracket, there's just like a down to earthness that I, I did not see in some of those other cities, which I really like. And just that emphasis on family or Ohana, which is really important. So I, I think it's a great place to live. I think it's worth, yes, sometimes I look at North Carolina, my gosh, I could have bought a house, a really nice house for what I paid for my down payment for this house that I'm currently in it, which is crazy. Uh, but, and I could be making a lot more and, and my kids could go to public school versus private school. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are negatives to coming here, but a lot of great things that are positives to being a, a doctor in practice here. And, but I think you really have to be rooted in the community or whether or not you're from the community, you just have to be invested and really want to make it work, whether or not you're a surfer or you just like hiking or whatever it is, because Otherwise, the cons will far outweigh the pros. So that is what I would say there. Yes, the flexibility of private practice versus academics. And again, I think it just depends on the academic institution that you're at. You know, I was at Boston Children's and we actually had a lot of flexibility. You know, we were in clinic a lot. It was, it was geared more towards a private practice model, to be honest. I could take off whatever days I wanted to, if I wanted to block off my clinic and take eight weeks of vacation, fine. But that affected my salary because they were modeled more with a bonus system based on your productivity, which is more private practice based um, with a base salary, as opposed to just a strict, you know, employed salary. So that's what gives you flexibility. If I want to take off this day, I, that's fine. But I know that ultimately it's going to come out of my income, which is what happens in private practice. You know, people will ask me about maternity leave in private practice. And when you're and practice for yourself, you know, the money comes from you. If you're not seeing patients, unfortunately, there's no income coming into the practice, but you still have to pay rent, you still have to pay for your staff, you still have to pay the lease on all that extremely expensive ophthalmology equipment. So, you know, I sometimes I, I t completely sympathize with people that say, like, oh, I didn't get a lot of maternity leave at this practice, but being the business owner, I also see that. That being said, you know, my staff can take whatever, usually we'll give them, you know, their, their, their vacation time. And then they, you know, we follow all those guidelines and I have given three months non-paid and kept people's positions, of course, um, because our staff are really good and we want to do whatever we can to keep them happy. We've, you know, our staff will bring their babies to the office sometimes if they, if they need to. Um, so from that standpoint too, I can be, I can do what I need to, to take care of my staff because I understand that being, being a mom and a business owner. And I want to make that flexible and make that easy for my staff as well if they feel like they can work with their children there and we have a separate kids waiting room like I you know some of them have just brought their kids if their kids don't have school and stuck them in the back with an iPad and they're fine so other of my staff feel like they can't work with their children there and so they opt not to do that so yeah but getting back I think it's just the difference between the private practice and, and um, it just makes it it's just dependent on um, where you are. Um, do I have any working mom tips yet? Yeah, tips, no tips. I do. So, um, we, have, we do a lot of organizing. I love organizing. So there's two blogs that I religiously read. Um, one is called iheartorganizing.com or blogspot.com or something like that. Just Google it and find it. And then I love the home edit too, because they just make everything really pretty and just labels. But so what we try to do, because my children are ages five, seven, and 10. So it's a little different in that there's a lot more work actually required when they're older because they've got all different activities and then they've got homework and then they've, we got to practice piano. I mean, there's a lot to do when we are picking them up from school at 5.15, we get home at six o'clock and we have to eat dinner. We've got to be like, just like on it. And so number one is just it's got to be a partnership. It's got to be you and your husband. If it's not you and your husband or you and your partner, whoever it is, um, then you, you might need to enlist help because it is hard with multiple children. I think, I don't think I could do it by myself if my husband wasn't extremely involved as well with the kids. 
Um, we will do a family meeting at night after dinner where you have this big dry erase board that I got on Etsy and it lists like, you know, mom, dad, Taj, Aria, Nick, and the activities for the day. So we'll go over, okay, Aria, you have tap dance tomorrow. So you need to make sure you pack your tap shoes in your backpack for school and boys, you've got swimming right after it, you know, so we just can get everything packed up and set for the next day. Okay, library, you need to return your library books, whatever it is. So that in the next morning, you know, we leave the house really, really early. We leave at 645 because there's a lot of traffic in Hawaii, another downer. Um, and we start our clinic around 730, 745. So I have to be one or the other of us, my husband or myself have to drop the children off um, before we go to work. And it just depends on our schedules and who's in the operating room that morning and whatever. Um, so it just helps to not be running around like a crazy person. Where's the tap shoes? Where's the towel for the swimsuit? You know, just get it all together. I think the family meeting thing really helps. And kids really like structure. I realized this a few years ago with my middle son because he was so good in school that he was kind of wild and difficult, or, you know, I would say difficult at home. Nobody else called him difficult. And it just came down to the fact that at home we were so unstructured and we were just like, you know, it, it, it was... Things were not organized. And once I instituted this organization, so, you know, I have, we have these cubbies as well, these mud rooms, and each kid has like a little like um, cubby where they can put their backpack. I have this um, clipboard Velcro there so they can put all their important information. Hello, Galax, um, from the school. So if they've got their lunch calendar and they want to know, so they can just, they really like being in the know. They like knowing what's coming up. It's really disconcerting for children to not know what's coming up. So I think that has really helped. I have also made these like recipe cards so that I can menu plan on Sundays, figure out what we're eating for the week. Um, I just laminated them. I have just like things like kind of almost like a meal, basically. It'll be like, you know, penne pasta with, uh, you know, Parmesan, broccoli, and bread. And on the back, I'll have where that recipe is, if it's Pinterest or if it's in an actual book or all recipes or whatever. And then I've listed the ingredients so that I can just grab that card and take a picture of it or add it to my grocery list when we're going. So Sundays, I grab my like five cards, turn them over. The backside's got the recipes on them. I mean, the backside's got the ingredients on them so I can just say onions, garlic, and just make my recipe list. And then when I go to the grocery store, you know, there aren't a ton of food delivery, uh, grocery delivery services here in Hawaii the way that they are are on um, the mainland. So um, I ended up actually going to a store as opposed to not. So that's basically my working mom tips, at least a little bit. I think that that helps a lot. And let me check IG and see if, let me know if you have any other questions. Oh, sorry, I'm trying, ah, I keep closing it by accident. There we go. All right. And then just, yeah, being, being a great surgeon. Um, oh, do you eat and cook organically? Where do you grocery shop? combination there's a local grocery store called times um there is a whole foods really close so we end up going there a lot i don't necessarily cook organically i do try to always buy local as much as possible especially with the produce i think that's really important there's certain things you know there's some articles about which things it's important to buy organically and which ones are not so we try to follow those kind of guidelines um so yeah and we do try to cook majority of the time, or I have someone come and help cook so that like I can text our babysitter recipes. I'm still playing with my diet right now. You know, I was, we were doing, we've been doing the pescatarian for about a year. Um, but I think with my particular genetic and family history, I think for me more, it's more important, the carbs, um, for type two diabetes, I have a lot of that in my family versus the actual meat and inflammation. We don't really have much of that in our family, the cancer, some of the, some people have been talking about that. So yeah, I'm still playing with my diet, but since we went pescatarian, actually it's been harder. So it's been about, yeah, about a year. It is harder to meal prep, I think, because I could make stuff on Sundays, like I could make a meatloaf and I would do it, you know, we never ate red meat. So I would do you know, ground turkey meatloaf or, you know, I could meal prep like a lasagna. And it's a little, I feel like when it's vegan or plant-based, it's a little bit harder. It has to be more fresh. Um, so it is a little harder, but 
you know, I, sometimes then I would just text the recipes to the babysitter and she could do them if I would just buy everything in advance and just try to meal prep as much as possible. But I think it's really important what my children put into their bodies. And I really enjoy cooking. I enjoy creating something that they like. You know, we don't create two separate dip meals at our house. It is our children. I don't know if you've seen my, my video about sushi night. Like they eat everything we eat. So sushi or they'll eat, um, you know, crab or we're eating Indian food or we're eating, you know, Thai. It's they eat what we eat. So if they're hungry, as my pediatrician said, they're going to eat. They decide how much they eat and we decide what they eat. So, you know, we, don't, we really try to be quite healthy with them. And, you know, before I had kids, I would eat like Lucky Charms every day for breakfast. I miss, oh, so good. But of course, as soon as my children could eat, I didn't want my children eating Lucky Charms. So I therefore had to stop eating Lucky Charms. Um, so yeah, a lot of Whole Foods, grocery shopping, for sure. It's just down the street. It's easy. It's healthy. Um, so it's expensive. But we do have Amazon Prime, so it's a little bit better. And honestly, everything is so expensive in Hawaii that sometimes the price differential between Whole Foods versus the just regular grocery store is not all that much. So, yeah. Yeah, let me know. What else do you guys have questions about? I'm going to check on the Instagram feed to see if if people had any other questions here. Um, yeah, so I do find, I just, I like cooking. I think other people just kind of make do with whatever they've got. Um, and, and that's fine too, you know, like there's no judgment in terms of what you need to do to get your family fed. And when you're working, it's, it is what it is. You know, we're all just trying our best and you know, I'm certainly not advocating a certain way is the only way. It's just, this is what works for my family. This is what's important for me. And I'm also at a point in my career and in my life, you know, I'm 43 years old. Gosh. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm at a point where I can hire someone to come in and help me with those things. But when we first started out, I couldn't. But also when we first started out, I didn't have three children and I wasn't doing multiple side projects and my practice wasn't as busy. So there's a, you know, Things kind of happen at your different stages of life when I think I kind of feel like for a reason. Anyway, so. Okay, and someone asked about the pay differential for MD versus um, DOs in Hawaii. I honestly don't think there's a pay differential. I'm an MD. I'm also self-employed. I have no idea what other ophthalmologists even make in my state, but there are ophthalmologists wear DOs and I cannot, I mean, there's no, the health insurance doesn't reimburse us differently as an MD versus a DO. So I don't think that a um, employed position would reimburse any differently for an MD versus a DO. So um, that's that question right there. And make me a sandwich. You know, what? I have a great recipe for this plant-based like vegan banh mi with this cauliflower and it was really it was really really good and then this other one from um what's her name one on the cooking channel that's the the really pretty one like the italian gi giada there's a really good one with like a rosemary or roasted vegetables it's, that's a really good but i can't make you a sandwich here um and i don't know if there's anything else or anybody anybody else has any questions about Mom stuff, life, working mom things, OD versus MD. So uh, OD is optometrists versus MD. If you're in the same field as ophthalmologist versus MD could be just any other specialty, pulmonologist, internist, pediatrician, ob -GYN. So I'm not sure if your question is going to optometry school versus going to medical school or the pay differential. Um, the health insurance, the insurance companies here definitely, well, certain ones, they will... It's a 90% will reimburse pretty much the same OD versus MD um, for like a vision exam. Um, but then, of course, a lot of the 99 codes are not really that available. Um, you know, like a 99214, 99215, you know, the inpatient consult codes when I go to consults are not available for the ODs. Um, there's one or two insurance companies here that reimburse differently or don't even reimburse. I think that like won't pay optometrists for 
nine, nine codes. I can't remember. So because we have an optometrist and employed optometrist was amazing. She's so good. And, um, so, but I think at least what I've seen is the optometrist clinic tends to be a little bit, um, fewer patients than a ophthalmologist clinic. You know, we see probably about twice the number of patients. I do. I see at least twice the number of patients as my optometrist does. So, um, you know, that could make a difference, but then the optometrists are also spending time because they have, a, you know, an optical shop and they're doing these really complicated contact lens fittings and, you know, a lot of them and like worth okay and all of that stuff too, which some of that's cash pay. So uh, I think there's a ton of optometry. I mean, I, I, don't know, I think like two to 400. I mean, I've given talks at the Hawaii Optometric Association. There's a lot of optometrists on the island and all are, I mean, most are so, so nice. Um, I'm just really interested in um, treating their patients well. So they've been able to survive out here. Um, how do I each, give each of my children one-on-one -on -one time? Oh, you have three young children in private school. Yeah, I, you know, I hear you. You feel like you don't give enough. Like that mom guilt, gosh, it is always there. I did a blog post on it because like at one point my son was, my oldest was like, I wish I was an only child. And he's, he's the sweet one. He's the one that just, you know, he's 10 now, just requires requires or demands the least amount of attention. So sometimes it's easy because he's just reading a book in his room to, you know, the other two are like, yeah, if you, well, you've probably seen my daughter, if you've watched any of my, I mean, she's like all over the place. And then my middle son is a mommy's boy. So he just is my, we say, you know, Hawaii Opihi. It's like one of these kind of sea creatures that like clings to the surface of the cliff, um, to the rock. So you know, I, it is hard. We do try to build in, I try to build in these, we call them date nights. We started doing them forever ago. They're not at night, but trying to do little things with each of the children one-on-one -on -one. though. Again, I, it tends to be me with the younger two. And then my husband with the older one, because he'll take my older son out surfing. And so we have to really make a conscious effort, you know, for him, like he doesn't spend as much time with my middle son. Uh, again, just because my middle son's like always wants to be with me. So, you know, we do have to make a conscious effort to like kind of swap because I don't want to only have my daughter. I want to make sure I spend time with my older son because he's very sensitive and I think he needs me just as much. So I think trying to build in those little date nights. And again, it doesn't have to be long. Like sometimes I just take my older son and my husband handles the younger two and I, we go for bubble tea and, you know, that's 45 minutes but it's our time to just sit in the car and it's one-on-one. -on -one. He doesn't have to compete with his younger siblings. We're really loud um, and he, we can just connect. So building that time in is really important. We try to do that on the weekends because the weekdays, gosh, it's so busy. Um, it's just, you know, and here's the thing, like you're doing amazing. Okay. Because we're all just doing our best. And I think our children see that. And I think that they are better for having, us being working moms and for having siblings and not to say that only children don't have it wonderful as well, but I think there is something to be learned from navigating. All right. So my older son really has to learn to advocate for himself because he is more quiet and the, and you know, his younger sister, five years younger than him will talk over him all the time. So, you know, he has to learn to like step it up a little bit because that's, he's going to need to do that later in life too. So yeah, I think it's really just, it's hard, but don't be hard on yourself, Kimberly. It's, it is, it's something that I think all moms struggle with, whether you have one child or five children. And, you know, I look on Instagram and I see these like beautiful families with five kids and I would love to have four kids and five kids. I just, I love kids, babies. I love children, but I agree. It's hard making sure that we're giving enough time and that they're, um, you know, in activities that they're, that are appropriate for them. And that, you know, sometimes when I, I do compare our crazy home life and it is crazy, like we have a Google calendar. My husband and I are always like, okay, what's going on? Where are we supposed to go? What's, what's next? You know, this one's got ballet. This one's got swimming. This one's got surfing right now. This one's got, you know, whatever it is. And then I have friends that have just um, one child and like that one child is in like five activities. Our children are just in two activities each. We cannot do any more. But, you know, we just, we all do the best that we can. So I hope that helps a little bit. We're all in the same boat. And whether you're a working mom or a stay-at-home mom, I think we all feel that mom guilt for sure. And we just, we can only do what we can, but try, try the little date nights. You know, it doesn't have to be long. And I think the children really do appreciate having that separate time where they get to do whatever, you know, just go for ice cream, just make it special. 
um, ours tend to center a lot around food or Barnes and Noble because my kids love going to Barnes and Noble and like we go and you know, they have that tree and we sit in, in Barnes and Noble and read a book together and they get to choose one book and you know, that's, that's like special for them. So um, it doesn't have to be anything expensive or you just take one kid to the park or, you know, but it does have to be mindfully, you know, scheduled. And I think that's the key. So yeah, I hope that helped at all. I don't have all the answers for sure at all. <laughs> like I'm struggling to figure it out. Like, all the time. And, you know, it is something that like, even just yesterday, like we had a crazy schedule. We had like, we got home, you know, I got home from work like 530, which is not bad. And, you know, the kids had swimming at 630, about 20 minutes away. So my husband took them. I mean, sometimes it's also about divide and conquer so that I could just like clean and unpack from my recent conference and just try to get everything, you know, we had all these little papers like this that, okay, I need to sign this kid up for cheerleading clinic and this for, you know, just taking care of all of that. So the divide and conquer helps as well before like my husband and I would try to like go to every single activity together and it was great, but it's just not feasible with multiple children. So yeah, that's where we are right now with it. Um, and I think it works for us. So yeah. Let's see. Oh my gosh, these glasses are like super dirty. Uh, I had the blue light protect, by the way, on it. And okay, any other questions for me? I'll probably sign off in about five if there's nothing else. Oops, trying to see if there's anything on Instagram. Okay, um, is there ever a time, oh, is there, okay, this is like very specific for ophthalmology. Um, is there ever a time where a child needs mild sedation to have a dilated eye exam? So this is specific to what I do. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist. I examine children in the office. And I really try to avoid sedation or an exam under anesthesia as much as possible. I just think about it like if it was my child, would I really want them getting all that anesthesia? If they, if they absolutely have to, of course, and we have done that. You know, I have some kids. Um, with Down syndrome and or that are extremely, you know, and there's a spectrum with Down syndrome. So I've had a couple that are very combative that I really cannot get close to uh, close enough to with my headset and my lens to be able to examine and that are nonverbal and they can't read the eye chart. So for them, we, we sedate. Um, but, you know, a lot can be achieved by two things. So if I find that they are in the office and it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to do an exam first i try to read the parents there are some parents that are just all about assuming the position and the position is this like well, i don't have like i should go get like one of my child's dolls but you stick the kid in the the lap of the parent you like cross they cross their leg over the kid is like this the parents put one arm around and then like this so that keeps their head straight that's only if the parents are with it and, and that's what they want to do. I don't love doing that because I don't want to traumatize a, a young child. So if I really feel like the child is going to be quite traumatized by that, um, I'll often just call the dilating drops in to a pharmacy. You know, if I just I'm walking into a room and I can't even, you know, check to see if they're following a toy or see if their eyes are straight, I'll just call the pharmacy and tell them, We'll just use the drop, we'll reschedule the dilated portion of the exam, use the eye drop, and then they'll come in with their eyes dilated. Usually the parents have to, they'll manipulate and put the, the eye drops in the eyes. But then at least when the kid comes to the office, they're calm. We didn't do that to them. And usually I'm able to get an eye exam. Like it's quite rare that I have to sedate a child to put, you know, to, to be able to get an eye exam. And then the second thing is I do a lot of, um, do a lot of singing. I don't have a great voice. I do a lot of just like talking and, and, um, but singing really helps just singing nursery rhymes and distracting the child. And I'm able to get, I'm fast too. I have to be fast so I can put everything and get a very quick retina scope. I can get a very quick look with the indirect ophthalmoscope. I know how to be able to do that in a very, very efficient manner. Um, while I'm singing Itsy Bitsy Spider or the Wheels on the Bus, those are my two go tos. So, Usually I really don't have to do the assume the position kind of thing though. That's only when like I have a parent that's just like the child is not going to be cooperative. They, they don't want to, you know, and we've tried dilating at home and they're still not cooperative and they don't want to bring the child in for an exam under anesthesia. That's usually when I resort to the hold. Um, but otherwise I feel like there's actually a lot of ways that you can get an exam in 
without resorting to to restraining the kid because I really don't like to do that. And I don't think it's necessary. And quite often there are other ways around it. So, um, you know, you can just be creative and, um, but I know like the dentist will do that too. I remember my dentist telling me how to hold my child. Um, and usually, you know, the, the kid will cry for a minute and then that's it. So, but if it seems like it's going to be hard, we, we just dilate at home. Anyways, so that was a very specific op though. Um, okay, someone asked about on Instagram about episcleritis treatment and flares after having cataract surgery. That's a really specific question. And I actually don't do a lot of cataract surgery anymore except for pediatric cataract surgery. I don't do any adult cataract surgery, my husband does. Um, and having episcleritis flares it sounds quite unusual to me that I would be concerned that it's actually uveitis or post-op inflammation and not episcleritis. So I don't know, but I will leave that to the cataract surgeons to discuss. But yeah, we got another about a couple minutes and I don't know, ask me lifestyle, fashion, whatever, whatever you guys want before I log out of here. And I thank you guys for joining me today. This was fun. I, I have not done a YouTube live before. I've done Instagram live. So, oh, my favorite places to shop. Nordstrom, as you can see by my Nordstrom shopping video. I love Nordstrom. I feel like there's just such a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Different. I mean, you can have stuff that's like relatively inexpensive and then they have the designer stuff as well. And I also think that they're, you know, they're lower end things like halogen. Um, is still like good quality. I don't feel like it's the fast fashion of some of the other stores like Zara or which I like, but you know, my Zara stuff falls apart and gets pulls in it and threads. And I'm really trying to be a little bit more eco conscious when you live in Hawaii, which is an island in the middle of the ocean. You know, I just, I don't want to be like donating a lot of stuff and throwing a lot of stuff away. So I'm really gearing more towards just getting pieces that are going to last me a while. So I love Nordstrom because the return policy is just so good. I mean, you can return stuff for almost up to a year, um, you know, with the tags and the receipt and everything. So I, and their customer service is amazing. And as a business owner, I really feel, I just, I appreciate good customer service and being well taken care of and, you know, everything's small and wise. And now when I go to Nordstrom, I know everybody. My husband doesn't like that, but I know everyone. So that's honestly my favorite place to shop for pretty much anything. And yeah, and then my second favorite to window shop is Dior because they are lovely. And I hosted a charity event there last March, which was really successful. And I got to know the store managers and the sales associates. And they're just the Dior boutique at Ala Moana is just they're the nicest people. So um, if you have a chance and you're looking for luxury goods, I would highly recommend going into Dior. And was I worry, ever worried about paying off student debt after graduation residency? That's a really, yeah, that's a super real question. So I was very, very lucky. I went to Duke for undergrad and I actually got an academic scholarship. So I only, I had a very small amount to pay for Duke, which is pretty amazing. So I graduated debt-free from college, from a private university. So that was great. Um, otherwise I would have gone, I had a scholarship as well to UNC Chapel Hill. So if I hadn't gotten the academic scholarship to Duke, I would have just gone to Carolina. And um, then, so basically what my parents had saved for being Indian immigrant parents, they had saved for college, but they didn't need that money because I, I was able to pay for it. And I got a bunch of other scholarships as well, um, national merit scholarships and you know a bunch of other ones that could pay for the rest. Of, so the Duke scholarship paid for tuition and then I was able to pay for like expenses and um, everything else with, with these other scholarships. So, you know, I graduated from college debt-free, which is huge. And so then the money that my parents had saved for college, um, they put towards medical school. And so that was wonderful. So that covered, again, pretty much they, my parents paid for tuition at med school, which is amazing that at that time, med school, Cornell med school um, was $20,000 a year. So that would have been 80 grand. I would have had to take out in loans. But then of course there's like the room and board and all of that. And I actually worked through medical school and I paid for all of that. Um, I was a tutor for a bunch of private high school students and I kind of was making some, some good money there. 
um, tutoring kids from Dalton and um, Spence and Riverdale. Oops. So I was tutoring kids. So I was able to pay for my living expenses. New York at Cornell Med, they gave us subsidized housing, which of course, because there's no other way you could live, afford to live in Manhattan. So I still remember because I was paying for this stuff. You lived, we lived in a one, like a one room dorm. So basically a dorm. It was me. And then I knew the girl from college um, and we shared an adjoining bathroom. So we both had one room. So it's no kitchen or any of that. Um, and that was $376 a month. Can you believe okay, that this is 20 years ago? So it's $376 a month. And then your second through fourth year, we lived in the apartments, which was a converted. And again, it's subsidized and it was med student housing. And that was a two bedroom apartment, but they had changed it. Cornell had changed them to accommodate three people. And that was 500 and like 20, I think a month. Again, 20 years ago, but still like really great. So it was definitely, you know, I tutored and I was making a lot of money tutoring because um, that is what these families were paying me so I could pay for all of that. And then the other ways I just, I live like a pauper and I think a lot of people don't do that anymore. I had a notebook and I was literally recording every 50 cents I spent at the soda machine. And I just, you know, I had a budget and I stuck to it and um, I was able to, you know, pay all my living expenses and um, rent and everything with the money that I earned tutoring. And so I had like one for med school, I had like one $10,000 loan. And I paid that off during my internship, which might sound crazy, but I just wanted to get it done with. So again, I just really like lived like a pauper and eat a lot of raw man. And I just got it done. I didn't, I don't, I don't like having debt. And, and I was in a good position where I didn't have like hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So um, so yeah, thankfully that wasn't much of an issue for me. My husband was in a similar boat, which is really nice. It's actually how we were able to start our private practice because he had saved up enough money for us to help put down a um, part of the down payment for our private practice. Otherwise we couldn't have done it because if we'd had a lot of debt, then the bank, no bank would have given us a loan. I mean, no bank gave us a loan anyway. We had to have it privately financed by the retiring position. Um, so I was never really worried about student debt, but what I was worried about was my first year in practice out here in Hawaii, going from a salaried position at Boston Children's. We, were, we took out a huge loan through the retiring physician and the bank. So we had two loans to pay off the practice. We did not take a salary for ourselves for the first six months. We just found out we were pregnant. And then this house came our way and, you know, it was so perfect. And yeah, so then we took out two loans to buy a house. So all of a sudden I went from like no loans to like four loans with no income. And that was a scary point. And yes, I did worry about paying it off and being destitute and not being able to be successful in private practice and with the patients stay with us and all of that. And the thing is, everybody has those fears, everyone, everyone, everyone. And you know, you got to where you are because you overcome those fears and you just work hard anyway. And, you know, it's that growth mindset. So, yeah. All right, guys, I need to go help do a little FaceTime phone call for a friend whose daughter got hit in the eye. So thank you so much for watching and I hope you subscribe if you don't already. And I will be posting updates and stuff soon. Thank you.